Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another uh, meeting, a joint meeting of the Hong Kong Study Circle and Hong Kong Philatelic Society, sponsored by FIAP, uh, the Federation of Inter-Asia Philatelic. Um, I'm so glad that uh, we have a really excellent speaker tonight. Um, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure actually to invite him to do a solo presentation on a very interesting subject that, uh, that you need a lot of research on. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I mean, Richard Whittington, I'm sure everybody knows, uh, you know, he, he's a very, very, ex he's an excellent researcher and uh, he's got plenty of uh, resources to study and time as well, I suppose, <laughs> since, since he's retired. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, tonight uh, or, or today, uh, he's, he's going to uh, talk about some very interesting uh, early uh, Hong Kong and Mac Macau uh, postal matters. So uh, off to you, uh, uh, Richard. You want to share a screen? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll start off by demonstrating my total lack of ability with technology. Right, let's see. How are we doing with that? Yeah. <laughs> So hopefully you can just see this beautiful picture of uh, one poem. Is that okay? Yeah. No. And you can't you can't see my cheating notes. Okay. Um, let's go. Before we start, um, uh, I would like to make a short explanation about my choice of subject for this presentation. So many people would think of, I was going to do it about 1940 rather than 1840. But many years ago, um, more than I really cared to think about, um, I acquired a set of the Reverend Morton's articles that he published in the 1920s and 1930s. And this sparked my interest in this early postal history of Hong Kong and the China coast. I'd always enjoyed history and even and when, particularly when I went to live in Hong Kong, but at that time I was frankly more interested in the very early stuff, uh, East India Company, Canton, Macau, and in particular private traders. But um, Mr. Monton, uh, switched me on to postal history of the early period. I already collected some other postal history. But over the years, I've collected a lot of uh, information, uh, basically to increase my own understanding of this subject. Um, my wife, who is long suffering, will confirm to you that my Small studio here in the suburbia of London is chock a block full of historical laps up. <laughs> I didn't touch the subject for a long, long time and deal with other, other things. But a year or so ago, Andrew asked me about this and then uh, Spink held a very interesting auction earlier this year. Uh, called the Opium War Sale. And then Sam Chu dug up something that really interested me. And uh, I started to write the article that Andrew mentioned, and then this presentation sort of came out of all of that. So it's really based on the article, but with some other extra stuff. Let me just sort myself out here. 
<coughs> so the presentation is in four <laughs> four parts. Uh, background, the cow hole cop, and then some the last bit, postal markings, which is maybe arguably the most interesting. But just to mention that we could have timeouts for nature or coffee breaks or wake wake ourselves up after any any or all of the first three parts. Um, but while while the acknowledgements are at the end, I'd just like to say thank you at the beginning to Andrew, uh, Sam Chu, and Neil Granger, who I spoke to about using some illustrations and stuff like that from the auction that he, he was in charge of. Thank you very much to him. Um, it only deals with civilian postal establishments. So it doesn't, this presentation doesn't deal with military post offices like the army one with the military post office, uh, Hong Kong marking and naval one. There are no naval markings, but there were naval postal establishments various places, although as we go through, it touches on it, but I haven't really done it. And as I said, it's just a reflection of where I'm at with my own education, um, from collation of published works, unpublished works, original research and all that stuff. <clears throat> just, I, I'm not gonna read it out, but have a look at the reading. Acknowledgements are at the end, but uh, I've mentioned the three that I would like to say. But the important thing is that although this material is completely beyond my means uh, and my bank manager, but this presentation is a sharing of a part of my collection of what is often referred to as classical Hong Kong postal history. It would be wrong to look at changes in postal matters without a wider consideration of what was unfolding in the region at the time. And the gentleman here is Imperial Commissioner Lin, who, very astute gentleman, um, and he was, he had pledged, um, agreed to go to Canton to eradicate the opium trade, which was illegal and principally involved British merchants. And to having done that, to reinstate legitimate regular trade as it had been in the past with the East India Company at uh, Wampoa and Canton. Lin actually was quite successful in the first part because he, he forced the British uh, to hand over all of their opium, well, almost all, uh, to him in the spring of 1839. And he also forced certain well-known uh, dealers, British merchants involved in the opium, opium trade to sign bonds that they would leave and never return to China. Ultimately, this resulted in the departure from Canton of the Superintendency of Trade. The Superintendency of Trade was basically uh, a quasi-Indian uh, government, uh, British government um, organisation that oversaw things on behalf of British residents and merchants. And they left in May 1839. But the second of these uh, objectives um, pledged with the emperor of China proved much more problematic to Lin. And through various schemes and threats, as well as indirectly through uh, the Portuguese authorities at Macau, uh, this resulted in all of the British subjects, apart from Two, I think. One stayed behind with his American wife, and another 
uh, just wouldn't leave. He'd been there for so long, Thomas Beale. And they evacuated Hong, uh, to Hong Kong Harbor on the 26th of August, 1839. The British did not want to go and trade inside what's referred to as the boat, which there would be more limited uh, naval support or whatever uh, if things started to go wrong. And the more that Lim pushed, the more the British resolve was uh, stiffened. So there's intransigence. What's happened here? In the middle of 1839, there were only about 25 foreign residents at Canton, mainly Americans, who traded on their own behalf, as well as, more quietly, on behalf of the British merchants who were no longer there. And they shipped through their ships um, merchandise from Wampoa near Canton through the bogue and out into the area where the British were. Um, on this, there's a map on the left side, then you can see Canton at the top and the bogue and so on, Hong Kong, Macau, and then Lintin was the traditional location of receiving ships for opium for the British. Uh, and American. And the other are uh, anchorages, which I'll mention in a minute. Anyway, the leader of the Superintendency of Trade was uh, Charles Elliott, and the arrival of two uh, of the Royal Navy ships, Folage and Hyacinth, in August of 1839, sort of strengthened his negotiating position, and he negotiated to recommence trade outside the Bogue. So in this area, if you can see that. But tensions remained high and there was, there was a big confrontation between uh, these two ships and uh, Ch uh, Chinese armed junks at Chunghui, which was on the east side uh, of the Bogue at the entrance to the Bogue. Tigris. So the, the merchant fleet, which was at Hong Kong, ca also came under attack. Basically, there were forts in where what is now Chim Sao Choi were Chinese forts. And also the, they had fire rafts and all this kind of things. And they moved from Hong Kong to the Tong, Tongku anchorage, which you can see down here, if I can make this one, down here. And this uh, anchorage, um, basically uh, just near Castle Peak, I think it's also called Ermston Bay. And the other anchorage, which you'll hear me talk about later, is at Kumsing Moon, which is just north of Macau. And th these anchorages in Hong Kong, were used at different times of the year, depending on the prevailing monsoon winds. So th these things that happen, uh, you can actually follow these events uh, through some of the covers that ex still exist. Ooh, what happened? Right. So for example, uh, when the merchant shipping was at Hong Kong Harbour from 26th of August, um, this letter was sent from there. Very early letters are known, uh, but this one is very late because uh, in the letter it states that the naval ships were leaving the following day to the Tonku anchorage and that the merchant shipping would obviously follow. 
reluctantly, by the way. Um, the details inside the shading table are the details of the route and all that stuff. And this, this letter was sent from a firm called Bibby Adam and Co, who were uh, located on one of the ships of Hong Kong Anchorage and were sent to London by the ship John Horton on the 12th of November, 1839. Um, it was rated as a ship letter, eight months, get to that in a short while, and went via the Cape of Good Hope. It took 154 days. So that's what, five months, roughly, to get from Chinese waters to uh, Liverpool, where it was struck with a Liverpool ship letter. And it arrived uh, in London on the 24th of April, and you could see the red marking there. So Bibby Adam were established in 1838, and they didn't last very long. In 1840, the gentleman Thomas Edmund, who sent this letter, returned to Bombay, where his brother was, and they together formed the firm of W. T. Edmund in uh, Bombay. And you will see that this name uh, as a forwarding agent on the number of later letters. I'm not sure whether I've showed one here, but we'll see. And then some merchants are confident enough to return to Macau, including Mr. John Silverlock, you know, a long correspondence from Mr. Silverlock uh, to his father in Chichester. Uh, this one is dated the 20th of November 39, and he was in Macau then. Uh, but earlier he'd been on the uh, Jardine ship, Earl of Clare. This letter was probably sent by the Rustam G. Kawaji, the Parsi um, trader, merchant, um, and left on the 25th of November, and was sent by Calcutta and Bombay, uh, Calcutta, Bombay, and then by Overland Mail, uh, by Marseille uh, to London, where it, uh, it arrived on the 13th of March, 1840. And it, mm. this mail contained latest dates. The latest dates was just the last dated letter in the mail of the 15th of December. So this wasn't the latest one. Uh, John Silverlock is quite an interesting character, but essentially he operated with uh, John Rag uh, in China, uh, but they were linked to Sanderson Frying Company in London. And you can see at the bottom of this uh, Sanderson and Fry London. Uh, who were asked to look after it and make sure it got to his father. Um, then, as we say, the merchant shipping went to Tonga Anchorage from about the middle of 1839. And some of the firms stayed there, such as uh, Holiday Wise, which was a, a big, long-lasting British firm in China. And here, this, this letter went via the uh, ship Tapley, which left Tonku on the 17th of January, 1840, and then unloaded this letter at Penzance, but I'm guessing that that was on the 3rd of June because it arrived at Deal, which was essentially the main um, holding point uh, in the channel. English Channel for shipping uh, on the third trip. So going back to sort of a bit of background, the antagonism between Chinese and British just continued and the Dent and company ship Ariel was sent with uh, Elliot's dispatches and what he wanted to do along with quite a number of uh, petitions and so on asking for uh, British government to intervene 
in China. And the aerial returned on the 2nd of April, 1840. So then Elliot knew what was gonna happen. And in accordance with those dispatches, a naval fleet and uh, armed force was put together, which, I've, which started to arrive on the 20, in the middle of June, 1840, excuse me. It's quite a sizable uh, expedition force. Um, which started to head north on the 23rd and 24th. This Charles Elliot uh, remained behind waiting for the, the joint, his joint plenipotentiary, uh, Admiral George Elliot, which was his cousin, uh, to arrive. And that happened on the 30th of June and off they went up to the north. And the so-called First Opium War was well and truly underway. This uh, painting shows uh, the force at Chusan, yeah, Ningpo, uh, which was the first, first, yes, I think so, the first port of call, as it were. Um, so eventually, turning to postal matters, the East India Company lost its monopoly and so, so forth in China in 1834. And Lord Napier, who came out at that time, organized local post offices at uh, Macau and Canton, run by a merchant shopkeeper, uh, Mr. Richard Marquit. And since that time, for a number of years, Postal matters, as they as they were, were handled very much by private individual companies. During the time of the East India Company, uh, incoming letters addressed to the foreign community, which were made up uh, in Indian in India, post offices, so principally Bombay, Calcutta, uh, possibly Madras, but not not, not really. And they were bagged and made out for the attention of the president, who uh, was either in Macau or Canton, depending on whether it was the trading season, October to April, or in Macau the rest of the time. And it was the duty of the steward and the butler to receive these mails from ship's officers have them taken to the president, who then took out the East India Company mails and then had them distributed to all and sundry. Uh, interestingly, Mr. Richard Marquick in the 1820s, early 1820s, was the steward. Uh, he left, I think, in 1825. Outgoing letters was handled similarly. Uh, if they were handed in to the EIC representatives, then they would be sent to Bombay or Calcutta. The Napier's post offices were essentially just the replacement of the functional EIC way of doing things. But in actual fact, Foreign community, i.e. principally those uh, private traders and so on, they didn't use the postal establishments, particularly for outgoing work. And they looked after themselves, basically. Um, how did they do that? Well, it was normal practice in those days for all, all of the ship's captains to carry mails privately. And they did that by delivering incoming letters to the agent or consignee for the ship, the agent, basically. And then they would, in, like the East India Company, take their own mail and then distribute the remaining 
to the other addressees. In many cases, they're commercial rivals. And for outgoing letters, for India, that went into India, for example, uh, to people in India or uh, the overland mail system, they would deliver them to the sender's agents at uh, the port, or they would hand them in themselves to the Indian post office where they first landed. So that would be Bombay, uh, Calcutta, or Madras. For, for letters sent to uh, UK, um, they would, in most cases, deliver them to the postal facility at the first port of call, where they would be chopped with, I think, familiar with these India ship letters or ship letter hand stamps, and then enter the home postal systems. In both cases, it was not unheard of for delivery of other parties' letters to be delayed uh, to their potential disadvantage. I think it, it's very important to accept that the timing of receipt of commercial news uh, was really uh, paramount in their mind. The advantage of early news uh, played a significant part in uh, how everyone conducted their business. And in fact, there's a well-known story that one of the biggest companies, Denton Company, failed uh, because their information was slower than uh, other people's, like uh, Jardine Matheson. Now, you might think that with all the increasing number of agents, consignees, shipping, more shipping, departing from China, Chinese waters, most of which carried mail, you might wonder why on earth would you want any sort of local post office? And the answer to that is, well, they were only really needed in terms of receipt of Indian mails. So mails that had been sent overland to India and then were sent onwards from there. And these would have been unloaded uh, at postal facility at Macau. And for outgoing correspondence, they really, they just acted as a focal point for those that couldn't actually organize in their own way to get their own letters onto the ships that were leaving uh, port. So the postal facility at Macau, which was more significant than at Canton, was established at Richard Markwick's Tavern, which was located at the very end of the Praia Grande in uh, Macau. And in fact, these two pictures show this uh, place. So um, if I can get my, where's it got? I've got two screens going here. Okay. Right. This building here was his tavern, sometimes called the Beach Hotel. And then the landing place uh, from Canton was just on the left side in here. This uh, was the San Francisco Green or Campo to San Francisco. And in fact, Charles Elliott also lived in here when he was there. And then in the other picture down here, which was at a later date, this is the establishment. So Richard Marquette died in the beginning of 19, 1836, excuse me. And the business at that location 
was continued by Henry Skinner, who was also uh, butler in the East India Company, and then later by Robert Edwards, in conjunction with Richard Markwood's brother, Charles. He basically ran the, the show in Canton, while these other gentlemen handled things in Macau. And I think the postal establishment at Macau, which also ran passage boats, small boats carrying people and letters between Macau and Canton. And I think you, you will be familiar with uh, that establishment referred to as the boat office at Macau and it actually had its own markings and um, I've written separately on uh, that subject, but if you want, in some future thing, you can always discuss this. So Robert Edwards uh, was not the last one to run it, uh, but he almost was. Uh, and it was taken, Mark Wick went in with a guy called John Smith, and it changed its name to an Albion Hotel, and later on it was owned by Mr. Duddle. Many of you will know Duddle Street in uh, Central. Well, Mr. Duddle, and then his wife, when he died, owned this establishment. Right, we're at the end of part one. So should we continue or should we have a five minute? We can continue if you're not too oh. tired. No, it's okay. I'm just going to have a bit of coffee. Okay. So we're now up to 1840. So the postal facility at Macau uh, changed hands and was now in the hands of a company called Hooker and Lane. And it was at the British Hotel, which was more in the center of Crowgrandy. And they ran the postal facility. They were also the agents for Thomas Waghorn. Thomas Waghorn was a, a, an important figure in speeding up um, organizing the overland route between India and uh, the UK over uh, from Suez to Alexandra. Uh, I haven't really dealt up with him in this thing. It's a whole different uh, story. But they were his agents and they took over from Mr. James Innes. And this continued until Hooker's death in the middle of 1841. Hooker and Lane were set up by James Hooker, who came from Calcutta, uh, who was clearly the man with money, and William Lane, uh, who was a, then a 20 year old, but had been resident at Macau for virtually all his life. Uh, they took over the business of uh, Stanford and Marks, who had run hotels at Canton and Macau since the middle 1830s. This William Lane was the son of another William Lane, uh, who died at sea in early in January 1832. And he was a business partner, partner of our Mr. Richard Markwick, who's in the firm of Markwick and Lane. Um, this younger William was also the elder brother of Thomas Ash Lane. And then, interestingly, these brothers in later years partnered with Ninian Crawford in the very famous and long lasting firm of Lane Crawford, which is still in Hong Kong today. Rich people spend their money there. Uh, Hooker and Lane uh, bought land at the first uh, auction uh, land sale in Hong Kong uh, in 1841. And they were intended to establish an 
themselves there. But Hooker died and it reverted to government. Um, and this Marine Lot 6 was at the end of Pedder Street. So government kept it and it was then converted into the landing places, which lasted for, well, essentially they're still there, I guess, you know, those things. <laughs> So this Hooker and Lane were mentioned in, I could only I ever find one uh, advertisement. This is from uh, 1840, when it announced males were going by a ship called the Carnatic, and that Messrs Hooker and Lane would take charge of later letters sent to the hotel. The consignee, the Carnatic, was a very old company, British company, Turner and Company. Uh, it sailed via the Cape of Good Hope in February 1840 and arrived in July 1841. It's 137 days later. But Turner and Company would not have used Hooker and Lane. This service was just there for those who could not organize themselves to get their own letters on board the Carnatic. Carnatic would have been stationed at Ponku, which was where uh, Turner and Company were still established. So they would have just put their own letters on the ship and then the ship's captain would have unloaded them at Penzance, as we can see, there's a Penzance ship letter. Um, there. Again, it was rated out. This Turner and Company, established by Richard Turner, who, would, who uh, was a ship's captain, but he settled in uh, Canton and Macau, principally Macau, with his family uh, from 1829, and he died there actually in 1839, but the firm continued until the beginning of the 20th century. It seems to have faded away in about 1905. And, and what, the mail routes that were available at that time um, were as follows. Uh, you could send your letters directly by private shipping via the Cape of Good Hope, or more seldomly by North America. Uh, your second, a bit more expensive, or rather more expensive, uh, you could send it via the overland route from the British post office uh, in India, which went by India, so you, by private ship to India, and then uh, to Suez, then across Egypt, and then through the Mediterranean. And it could either, you could either pay, or the person who received it would pay uh, for it to go via Falmouth, which was cheaper, or a bit more expensive, it could go via France, uh, via Marseille. And so you would just indicate what you wanted on your cover or to uh, the captain, and off it would go. There were, there were established mail packets running between India and Egypt and through the Mediterranean. And then from Marseille, we'd go by train uh, up to the English Channel and then sort of. Uh, the most expensive was the overland route by Thomas Waghorn. He prided himself on getting your letter to its destination quicker than anybody else. But, um, I haven't covered that this particular presentation, otherwise we'd be here all week. So for ship letter rates, basically uh, they changed at the beginning of 1840, I think, 
to become weight based rather than number of sheets. And it was eight pence up to half an ounce, and then one and four pence up to one ounce, and then one and four pence for each additional ounce or any part of that. And here is a letter rated one and four pence. Sorry, it's a bit upside down. Uh, it was sent by William Leslie Dent and Company to his father in 11th of February, 1840. So this was a one up to one ounce ship letter. It went by the Queen Mab, via the Cape of Good Hope, leaving Macau 21st of February and arriving June on the 6th of June, which was pretty quick, very quick. I won't, uh, I think we'll be here all day if we discussed all the different rates and everything, but if you've got a copy of Lee Scamp's very excellent 1986 book on postal rates up to 1845, it's all in there. Other ship letter rates here, uh, top right is also one or four pence, one ounce. And the details are there. It went by Charles, the Charles Grant. And then the one on the left is also from William Leslie. And this was two and eight pence. So that was a two ounce, up to two ounce ship letter and went from the Parrot Hall. Uh, 161 days, and the other one took 111 days. So the Parrot Hall, obviously. Was a slow ship. A much rarer routing is via North America, um, which usually took considerably longer. But this particular one was sent from Bibby Adams, we mentioned that already, in 1839 via New York, by a uh, forwarding agent in New York. And it took nine months to get to London. But it was it was rated eight for a half ounce ship letter. Not quite sure why it took so long to get to New York, but uh, time, more homework. So packet letter rates via Falmouth, that was uh, one shilling up to a half an ounce, and then two shillings for an ounce, and then two shillings for each additional ounce or part. This letter was sent by Turner and Company. There are a lot of Turner and Company covers around. This one is a one shilling rate, so half ounce. And then it was sent. You can, if you see the Bombay Oval, with an oval with India in it, that was the Bombay Post Office's way of uh, saying this was going via the overland route, not as a ship letter. If it doesn't have India on it, uh, well, there's a generalization, but usually it was sent by ship, ship letter because someone hadn't put on it via Marseille in this case or, or whatever. So this went by private ship, probably the Kitty, uh, which departed Chinese waters on the 5th of August. And then by the overland mail that departed Bombay on the 1st of November. This was on the steamer Victoria, uh, which arrived in London 14th of December. Uh, it, the cover is actually annotated received 14th as well. Uh, it wasn't the last one. The latest dates in that mail were 4th of August. Then you can send it via Marseille. This is a bit more complicated because it had a French element and an English element. Who got, whoever got your money uh, or your, your addressee's money. Um, it was made up of uh, 
single French rates, which were based on a quarter ounce, a tenpence, and English rate of a half an ounce or one and tenpence. So if you had a half ounce letter, it was two and eight, two and eightpence, or three quarter ounce, three and six, or one ounce, six and tuppence, and so on and so on. This one here is three and six, so it was up to three quarters, more than half, up to three quarters of an ounce. And it was sent by Madras. You can see there Madras stamping of 17th February paid. That means that uh, somebody paid for this on, on his behalf or part of it on his behalf. It's not easy to tell. And this made its way from Madras across to Bombay and ended up on the same vessel, the Victoria, uh, which arrived via Marseille on the 5th of April, 1842. Mr. Anstruther was uh, Chu San at that point in the army. This is another one. This is rated three and six again for a letter by France as the Oval India and was sent on the 5th of May, 1840 from Russell and Company, who were pro probably the biggest American firm in China. Uh, been there since the 1820s and sent to Rothschild. Two interesting things about this letter is that it was carried privately to Bombay for the attention of Forbes and Company, who are a forwarding agent. And then it was sent via the Persian Gulf, which was an unusual route for the overland rail. Um, usually they went to Suez and then overland from there, but they, they, they experimented with routes that went up the Persian Gulf as an alternative, but it didn't, didn't take very long until that was abandoned and everything went far suit. So forwarding agents, just want to mention them, they played an important part. So people like Forbes and Company, this kind of arrangement was uh, commonplace. So they, they uh, to start with, they just organized things for you and made sure it got on the right ship and the quickest one and all that kind of thing. And their role became more prominent when um, some form of like prepayment of uh, postage was required uh, in India. So you could send your letter to the agent who would pay the post office in India for the incoming and outgoing sometimes um, postage. And then he would keep an account for you and then you would pay him from time to time. So they, you'll see very many, many, many letters via forwarding agents, very common. The other common thing was everyone used to send their correspondence in anything of any sort of commercial interest or value. They used to send in duplicate, indeed triplicate, by different ships or different routes. Uh, this was also common practice uh, from time immemorial. And I can, I can remember, I think recently, there was uh, a cover from uh, Chris Norton, who showed one that was just before the Japanese invaded in 18, 1941, sorry, get my centuries mixed up. Um, and th that was also labeled as a duplicate to one of their staff, a lady I can't quite remember, uh, in England. So it continued for donkey's years. And this particular uh, letter came from uh, Wetmore and Company, an American firm in Canton. Um, 
they started in 1834. There are many, many letters uh, from Wetmore, including local ones up and down the Canton River and letters to uh, their partner, uh, Morrison Crider and Company in London, who don't seem to be doing very well here. Yeah, they're in liquidation. So this, this letter went from the Lloyds, again, rated eight, and it was offloaded at Ramsgate on the 19th of June, 1841. Okay, uh, the next two slides are three letters sent virtually at the same time by Turner and Company. Uh, as an illustration of people sending things, you know, one after the other on every ship that was leaving. So the, the top, sorry, excuse me, the top, uh, Left hand one um, was sent from on the 3rd of January 1842. And it was forwarded by Richie Stewart in Bombay, who were the uh, forwarding agent that Turner and Company used predominantly. Uh, it was a two and eight pence, half ounce letter to go via France. And it, would, and it went in the mail, Victoria, the 1st of March, 1842. And the latest date was the 17th of January in that mail. The one on the bottom left was also finished writing on the 3rd of January. But the first one, top left, top right, sorry, you can see the forwarding chart has a received 17th of February marking, whereas the one on the bottom left was received on the 28th, so it went on a different ship. So the one on the top right probably went by the Clipper Water Witch, which departed from Macau Roads on the 4th and arrived on the 6th of February. And then it would have gone by DAC, which was the uh, overland transportation route to Bombay, handled on the 17th by Richie Stewart. Then the bottom left one was actually received by Richie Stewart on the 28th of February. And this was dated the 3rd. And this probably went by the Vansitar, which also left on the 4th of January and arrived at Bombay on the 28th of February, which is the day that Richard Stewart picked it up, it was given to them, and they quickly put it into the mail for the following day's trip to, uh, the, to Suez. The third one, and by another one, and this was, the letter was finished on the 17th, so, it went on the John O'Gaunt, uh, which took it to, uh, well, it, it was labeled that it should go on the John O'Gaunt, but actually I think that it went on the Herbert Crom Compton. And this Herbert Compton departed on the 18th of January, 1842, and arrived, uh, in Bombay on the 28th of February, 26th of February. So it was handled by Richie Stewart on the 28th. Reason, uh, 27th was a Sunday. So the ship arrived on the Saturday. Richie Stewart dealt with it on the Monday. And then it was put on the Overland Mail by the Victoria uh, for the following day. So this, this, particular cover would have been uh, the latest date or one of the ones with the latest date that arrived in the UK uh, 
on the 5th of April, 1842, by Marseille, the Victoria Rishon. So that just shows, you know, what they were, what they were up to uh, day by day. Anyway, back to uh, 1840 and the expeditionary force. The arrival of this force was up to 4,000 men, uh, basically caused quite a change in how postal matters were dealt with. Uh, they, they're sort of very relaxed and not very busy. Local postal establishment was just basically overloaded. And there are many complaints. Uh, and uh, this culminated in the management being taken out of the hands of private enterprise and put into the hands of the superintendency of trade. The change was essentially to improve matters for the military and navy. Uh, it, it didn't do so. But, um, but of course, it also applied to everybody else, foreign residents and so on, where, where their letters were handled by the post office at Macau and postal authorities in India. So in the end of 1840, there were regulations published for how the post office at Macau should be run. So I don't want to read all this out, but basically uh, it was run by Mr. Hooker's clerk, so that would have been, the, the blue is my own add-ons and the yellow highlighted is perhaps the more interesting. So the clerk would have been possibly William Lane or more likely uh, a Portuguese. The postmaster mentioned in the second point was Alexander Johnston. He was the deputy uh, boss of the, Superintendency of Trade. So it was under his management and it was the responsibility of the Superintendency of Trade. And you can see in the bottom there, they just said that basically if letters went through India, then there was a process. But if you put them directly like a ship letter to uh, England, then you just handed them over to the consignee at the store. Then, if, if letters were sent uh, to go overland, then they were sent to either Singapore, Calcutta, Madras, Bombay, whichever was first, and then sorted out from there by the postmaster at that location. In, incoming letters were asked to be separated for those at Chusan. So that was uh, Navy and Army at Chusan. And separate boxes uh, for the Army and the Navy. And the military one was addressed to General. Major General Burrell, who was the head of the military at that time, and also referred to as the governor of Chusan. And the naval one would be to Captain Bourgier of HMS Blanc. But this wasn't for very long, in fact, very short lived, um, because Elliot, as was his wont, uh, negotiated what he thought was a settlement with Chinese authorities, uh, which fell, fell apart. And he ordered the evacuation of Chusan, which those two gentlemen were very happy to oblige him with, and quickly uh, evacuated and returned to Hong Kong waters. So the point, the point of this is two points. Uh, one, that uh, the military, and the Navy always wanted to deal with their own matters, which is something pretty familiar with. Uh, and that Burrell was at Chusan at that time in charge of the military 
postal arrangements. Later on, uh, he was his his uh, conduct was frowned upon uh, somewhat, and uh, he was left at Hong Kong, uh, where the military post office was established uh, under his tutorship. Basically, the, the, these military ones, they would have, on the flagship, which was in Canton waters, would have been a postal room and someone looking after the post. Similarly, at uh, Chusan and so on. Um, this this was just uh, confirming the appointment of uh, Johnston because of all the complaints. This was a letter from all, Lord Auckland to the Court of Directors, uh, East India Company in London. So we're already, this is start of part three. So. Anybody wants me to stop for a short while? Just shout up. Okay. So uh, I think we're all aware that Hong Kong Island was occupied on the 26th of January, 1841, uh, by some Marines uh, hoisting a flag at uh, what became known as Possession Point over the top of Shenhua. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in February of 1841, the first merchant started to build stuff over there, but really nothing much was happening because it was unclear as to the future of Hong Kong. Um, but some people pushed the matter by building, so to make it more difficult to not take over Hong Kong or that kind of thing. Uh, and so on, but some were quite wary, and most of the merchant community stayed at Macau for the time being. The Chinese side essentially tried to uh, delay and uh, just cause disruption to any kind of uh, resolution, military resolution by Elliot. And Elliot, for his part, was seems to have been uh, more intent on uh, est establishing a means of trade rather than uh, dominating the situation. And basically, um, the government back home decided that he should be replaced and sent out uh, Sir Henry Pottinger and Admiral Parker to take over the uh, naval and the military. And they arrived at Macau on the 9th of August, 1841. Meanwhile, um, when Elliot was away in the north, he asked Mr. Johnson, uh, to look after the commencement and arrangements at Hong Kong Island. Uh, this gentleman was a long time civil servant, to use modern parlance, uh, born in 1812. Uh, his father was also a distinguished civil servant. And he came to China with his cousin. You know, there's a lot of cousins and stuff involved in Hong Kong's history. Uh, he was Lord Napier and he was his private secretary in 1834, so he was 22. And he remained in the service, um, eventually became deputy superintendent in 1837. And he supervised the early days of Hong Kong. He eventually uh, retired in 1853, somewhat dissatisfied uh, to Suffolk, uh, but he, he died in California where his son had a ranch. So 
So included in his arrangements at Hong Kong was the establishment of a post office there on the island. And in the 24th of August, he informed the authorities in India that he had opened, or he made regulations for a post office and asked that all mails for the Chinese expedition, etc., cetera, uh, be sent to him at Hong Kong, where he would arrange it. And he said that the clerk who, this would have been uh, Hooker's clerk, uh, would cease uh, receiving his $25 a month uh, in the 31st of October, by which time it wouldn't be necessary. So he was establishing the post office in August 1841. And it was thought to have opened in a temporary mat shed, uh, which was uh, common practice at that time. And an, a notice was issued on the 25th of August, which I think everyone would know about, um, that letters should be handed to the harbour master, William Pedder, and uh, he would then get them to the post office and vice versa on the way out. The bit of the map on the bottom left um, was the earliest map of the northern uh, coastline of Hong Kong Island. Um, and it shows a post office. Let's see it. Oh, God. Let's see if I can find it. Lost my cursor. Uh, uh, it's sort of in the middle, the left of the road, the road heading up. And unfortunately, um, like rather a few things, this is this map's rather distorted. So I thought to start with that, oh, this is the location where it was set up originally, uh, because it's in a different place, or looks to be in a different place to uh, uh, where we know it was shortly after this. But when we look at this, and at the top, you can see the record office, present government, House. Well, that didn't become that usage until February 1842. So by that time, it had already, uh, we know where the post office was. So th this is probably a bit of a distortion of scale, but interesting nonetheless. So Johnston was in charge of the post office and he, he immediately offsided and totally annoyed all of the merchants who were basically at Macau by uh, saying that all their letters would have to go to Hong Kong first to be handled and then back to Macau. And rather nonsensical really. I not fully understood why why he did that or whatever, but it really he uh, annoyed everybody. Uh, principally it was in associated with incoming incoming mail. And there were letters in the newspapers and all sorts of comments of one year uh, where mail came in. And it was landed at the hotel, which would have been normal practice. And but then it was sent to Hong Kong and came back four days afterwards, by which time a ship had already left, which could have been used for sending replies. So this was really uh, pouring oil on a fire. 
and this this continued. And the matter was sent up to Pottinger, who was um, at Ningpo uh, with the expedition, and he he basically told um, uh, Johnston that he got it wrong and that he should sort it out. Uh, which, which he, he did uh, by appointing Mr. Patrick Stewart um, as, a, as an agent in uh, Macau to accept and open mails and to put mail together and put it on the shipping leaving from Macau, which was virtually all the shipping. So He's offsided not only the merchant population, also Pottinger, and also the Indian uh, postal authorities who expressed their disagreement uh, to him in a letter later in the year. So in uh, Hong Kong, then uh, Mr. Fitzgibbon, who was the initial clerk in charge, he worked for Johnston, who was his clerk. He's thought to have died on the 8th of October, 1841. And then he, he was succeeded by two clerks, Mr. Mullally, who was in charge of the post office, and Mr. Palmer, Jock Palmer, who was in charge of the letters. But that was only until uh, February 1842 when uh, the superintendency moved to Hong Kong from Macau and Palmer was left at Macau to look after the postal establishment there. And then on, Mr. Malali was on his own. So in November 1841, Johnson told Pottinger that a small post office had been erected and finished. And this was confirmed in February 1842 by the editor who said that um, the post office was in existence. So another distorted uh, picture here. Um, I thought oh, it might show the post office, but. I think it's a little bit like the map earlier. Something that uh, I just don't know how this works. Oh, you can see here this building here. I thought, oh, that could possibly be it, but I'm not sure. This was the buildings known as the records office. That's why he's got a flag and so on. It's a government house. This was a go down, a storage facility. Down here was all the army and navy. Uh, the, the settlement of Victoria. Um, over here. The location of this first post office, i.e. the first permanent building, um, was described in 1843. And it was above the parade ground, which was an open area, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, essentially, it was located in the grounds of what is now uh, St. John's Cathedral, which is on the right hand side of the main road, now uh, Garden Road, which leads up the hill. So the location was confirmed in by Alexander Gordon's systematic mapping of northern. Hong Kong Island. He was he was essentially the land officer. 
that time. Uh, he various titles, but that's what he was. And you can see here that the post office, the one on the right is the sort of original one. And then the one on the left is the one that was sent off to uh, London to show them what they were up to. And uh, the post office is shown here, which is now the grounds of St. John's Cathedral. And then this building here, number 82, was known as Johnston's House. And this, this building, through various changes and so on, ultimately uh, became the Court of Final Appeal until 2015. It's still there today. Now, the other interesting thing here, for me anyway, uh, is the, this thing, the proposed site for the church. So the church was not going to be where it was, where it is now. It was going to be on the other end of the parade ground, which is this flattened area here. And at that time, the church services were held in a mat shed. There was no, there was no cathedral or colonial church, and the post office in that small building referred to just now was knocked down to make way for it, and it was uh, construct construction in eighteen forty seven. So by that time, of course, it was the Hong Kong post office was in the junction of Pedder Street and Queen's Road. Uh, the church opened in 1849 as a colonial chapel, and then later it became a cathedral in the 1850s. So the map here, you can see Government House here. That was uh, Johnston's house. Reason that uh, it was used, it was rented by government uh, to use as a government house instead of the government buildings up here, which was the old records office uh, in 1845 when Collinson did this map. But there is no building shown on the other side of the road where the first post office was. And it was then located, as I just mentioned. Um, the picture at the right was in the 1850s, but um, church is up here, of course, and the military is over here, which was later Victoria Barracks and so on. And then on the right-hand side here, was uh, Johnston's house. <coughs> Sorry. There's, as I mentioned, the superintendency moved over in February 1842 to uh, Hong Kong, and Mr. John Rickett uh, was left behind as the government agent. And he accepted the open mails, accepted mails, put the mail, arranged for the mails to go on, the ships leaving Macau roads and so on, which, which was much more than the Hong Kong post office. And he was assisted there by Mr. John Harlan, as I mentioned. So John Rickett was an old country ship. Country ships were the uh, indented shipping between India and China, carrying all sorts of stuff. Um, and he, essentially, he, he was given an allowance to carry out the function. John Palmer was sent over there. Um, 
he got fifty dollars a month, and he continued there until March eighteen forty three. Rickett was there until eighteen forty five. Um, it was just a small establishment. The the accounts for the superintendency of trade have amounts. Um, in 1842, first half, uh, for loading and unloading postal packets in the shipping at Macau Roads. Uh, so they, that's how it was done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in April 1842, <laughs> I've sent someone to sleep. <laughs> Uh, Robert Edwards was appointed in April 1842. Um, his appointment letters there. Importantly, no charge of any description on letters or parcels. Important. Then an unpublished uh, article re makes reference in the top there to the military post office established under the orders of Major General Burrell for another time. But that's the first time I've seen that specifically mentioned. And then everyone was very pleased about Mr. Edwards's appointment. Uh, many of them knew him from days gone by, boat office, Macau. Um, but why didn't why didn't Edwards take up the appointment at, from the start? Which I guess he might well have done, but he wasn't he wasn't in China. He had to uh, go back to England. His wife um, died on the voyage back to England in eighteen thirty eight on the ship General Kidd and. Um, presumably with their very young son. So he had to uh, leave Macau very quickly uh, in November 1838, and then went to England and then established his son in some kind of boarding school or care, care school in Kent because his son, James, was only three years old. And then he returned to China, and he returned and uh, arrived back in China at the end of 1841, 15th of December. So that, was, that could explain why uh, he, he wasn't... Uh, there uh, from the start. <coughs> the, the complication in the postal arrangements, um, which caused Edwards to resign and leave the role of man in charge of the post office, uh, was that with Hong Kong becoming an entity outside the East India Company's possessions. It was subject to postal charges when mail went through India. And this started to raise its head in the middle of 1842, and this is rather complicated, so I decided not to uh, include it here for the sake of relative brevity, and this needed uh, more staff, more administration, and a bigger building. And this was resolved in 1843, which is outside the scope of this, but it's relevant in so much as it was said that the post office establishment would move back 
to where it started. So that means that it went to somewhere else, but I do not know where that was. Um, but my guess is it was one of Robert Edwards's properties. Uh, he, he had a number of properties and was something of an early property speculator. Okay, part four, I'm starting to flag. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, postal markings. Uh, in 1840, 1842, there were no uh, postal markings British-wise uh, at Macau, so that makes things easier. And there were two known uh, military markings in that period. One was at the Web Type 1 at Ningpo and the Web Type 2 at Hong Kong, but we leave that to uh, a separate day. Not next week, please. Um, so the first marking at Hong Kong was, is known as a web type three, and these are genuinely rare. Uh, it was a locally made circular hand stamp, and there are two subtypes. The first one was as it was originally, with uh, Hong Kong in the centre, 1841 below, and some roses and post office at the top. And then the second subtype was with the one taken out and replaced by a manuscript two. For the first type, there's only one known shown there. And for the second type, there are eight known covers. Uh, and four pieces of covers, all, all of which seem to have been to uh, Mr. Johnston. So this one, the, the only known one is the one shown here, and it was sent to Mr. Robert Owen, who was the second master of Her Majesty Cutter Louisa, which was wrecked on the southwest tip of Lantau on the 21st of July, you know, severe typhoon. The sender would not have known that. Uh, so this, uh, this cover was probably handled uh, in late, later in 1841. And I, I would imagine that it was after uh, the post office was in its first permanent building in November. 1841. It was in the Ishikawa collection that is now safely in the hands of the Hong Kong Post Office's uh, collection. Uh, interestingly, Charles Elliott was on board the Louisa uh, at the time, and he this vessel was used primarily by him and uh, his commander uh, as their personal transport. These are the details of the eight uh, known uh, second subtype, web type three uh, covers. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to go through the, <laughs> all of these. Um, I'll just leave this here for a, a short time. Now, in the, the, the thing to be wary of uh, is the column titled Recorded Dates, because this is quite misleading, because they are usually the date that the sender wrote, wrote the letter usually, and many of these are from the people in the active service in the exhibition. And the date that the Hong Kong Post Office 
would have handled the item is anybody's guess, but it can be narrowed down to a certain extent, but it could be miles away from uh, the recorded date. There's only cover six and seven originated from Hong Kong. So we know from cover six that 25th of June, uh, this hand stamp was used. But apart from that, I, it's not very easy at all. Um, so for, for example, if we look at cover two, the Clement Edwards, is it, these are quite well-known correspondences. This letter was received on the 9th of December, 1842, although it was written on the 9th of May. And so that means that it went um, in the November overland mail, 1st of November from Bombay. And it would have been handled later than the departure of the Clipper Waterwich, which connected with the previous overland mail, and it left Chinese waters on the 28th of July. So even though this is dated the 9th of May, the likely date it was handled in the post office would have been August 1842. Not so easy. So I think they exist from what, what? Sorry, Richard, yeah. Charles Chen speaking. Yeah. Uh, as a sign note for the uh, uh, hand stamp, yeah. uh, you notice of uh, uh, two subtypes. That means uh, for the type three, we have two subtypes. One is uh, 1841, and yeah. that type will be 184 with the two, figure two manuscript. Yeah. Uh, I have noticed that for a long, uh, I think it's uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, there was an information concern about this web type three with uh, 1846. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah, on the piece. That, was uh, published in, uh, I think it's a long time ago by John Shaw and uh, reported by Peter Seth. I think it is uh, at least a, a few decades ago. Yeah. Uh, I bring up these uh, small pieces of information because I have, uh, I had uh, written a, an article uh, to challenge the 1846 piece. Yeah, uh, would be highly probable a fake. Therefore, yeah. uh, just to put a, a footnote over here, a sign looks over here that uh, on your type B situation, there yeah. might might just might be okay, a, a another type. Possibly, yeah. I, my, uh, Charles, I didn't put that one in. One, uh, it was sort of a bit outside the scope of this, but two, my own. My own feeling is that the 1846 one is uh, uh, not, <laughs> not to not to be thought about too much. <laughs> I, I'm also in it, it was uh, it was it would be a fake. But anyhow, uh, some guys, uh, particularly another another philatelic association in Hong Kong, intended to yeah. believe uh, their. Uh, the pioneer member that the report will be a genuine one, but I don't believe so. Sorry, I never, I never use the word fake because I'm, I'm not a great believer in using that word. But uh, I think uh, very unusual. And uh, okay, uh, I still recall that uh, the reported inking of that uh, type three, uh, 1846, was yeah. in fake inking. Black thinking, not the usual red thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Okay, thank you, Charles.
Okay, so in, in summary, um, my feeling is that the only uh, existent examples of this second subtype, apart from Charles's one, um, were handled at the Hong Kong Post Office between June and August or early September 1842. Therefore, we should think, why? <laughs> why are there no examples of the first half of 1842? And why are there no examples in late 1841 for the first subtype? I mean, first, my first thought was that people just didn't use the post office. They didn't really trust it. And the merchant community like to do things themselves with their mail. But secondly, which I haven't mentioned here, uh, is that everyone was in Macau. There was virtually nobody in Hong Kong and all the, all the shipping went via Macau roads. There was the odd one that sort of came from Hong Kong, but nothing very much. So. I don't think there was very much outgoing mail handled at the Hong Kong post office. But just to complicate matters, uh, I noticed when I was looking up stuff for this talk that in the 11th of May, 1842, London newspapers reported that several letters were received via Marseille, bearing an extraordinary postmark of Hong Kong in China. These would have been web type three, uh, presumably uh, second subtype, which would have been handled based on their on the reported arrival. Uh, between January and February, 1842. So they, there are or were uh, covers in existence in that period. And there's just, there just aren't any examples surviving. Or maybe they do, but they're hidden away in archive. Maybe locked away somewhere. <laughs> yeah. It's gone yeah. Or in Cambridge. Yes. Yeah. Jardine. Yeah, Jardine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or in Paris. Um, I think that this handstone was only used at the Hong Kong Post Office. That's fairly obvious, I guess. And probably only for letters originating in Hong Kong or on transit mail that was handed in at Hong Kong. As I said, everyone was still over in Macau in the first half of 1842, and virtually everything would have been handled in Macau, I think. Uh, we mentioned earlier about monies in the uh, accounts for handling mails in and off, on and off, sorry, uh, shipping in Macau roads, for example. Anyway. Let's deal with one that did come from Hong Kong. This was the latest example to come on the market. Um, it was in the David Feldman sale in 2014. And the, the, the letter inside was dated the 25th of June. And it's the earliest known cover from Hong Kong Island. Hong Kong when they were in the shipping in Hong Kong Harbour, uh, the earliest known one is 9th of September, 1839. But from Hong Kong Island itself, I believe this is the earliest. And it was carried on the Governor Doherty that sailed from Hong Kong to Macau on the 26th of June. Thank you, Andrew. Um, <laughs> the enclosed letter um, which was dated 25th of June, was sent 
from the Reverend Theodore Jose, uh, who was charged with the administration of the Catholic mission in Hong Kong. And it was sent to Father Libois, who was the procurator of the, um, um, I know Philippe's out there, so I'm gonna avoid trouble here, uh, the French mission based at Macau. And this letter was received on the 27th of June, presumably collected uh, from the British government agency run by John Ricketts. Um, unfortunately, like many others in the summer of 1842, the Reverend Jose, who had arrived there in 1841 and was one of the first settlers of Hong Kong, uh, died of fever on the 4th of August, 1842. Um, this was recorded uh, with an obituary in the newspapers of the day. Um, so this is really quite a fascinating cover, uh, for me at least. And it's I'm pretty sure it will not be the only one. Uh, just an interesting aside, um, Father Libois uh, moved the establishment over from Macau to Hong Kong in 1847. And the French mission occupied a large house in Staunton Street, above Central District. And these premises, were sold to Libois in 1847 by none other than our Mr. Robert Edwards, the property man, postmaster. <laughs> <laughs> the second marking, uh, Web Type 4, is the well, well known, I think, but is the oval frame Royal Arms hand stamp. Um, and thanks mainly to Andrew, I think, uh, we know of at least 88 examples of this locally made hand stamp uh, used between 1842 and 44, outgoing covers, incoming and transit mail items. Now, although there are differing explanations uh, over time, with what this hand stamp meant, uh, it's my opinion for what it's worth, that it was merely uh, to indicate processing, that it had been processed basically by the Hong Kong Post Office. It, at the beginning, there was no prepayment. Um, and to think that it was stamped for that purpose, I think, it's not accurate, at least at that time. The other thing is, as we can see from these two uh, illustrations here, then the one on the left is the superintendency of trade marking, and the one on the right is the web type four. And they're very similar, uh, but they are they represent the lion and the unicorn, uh, England and Scotland, basically. But it was the emblem or coat of arms of the United Kingdom. So this was an official hand stamp. And I think given the nature of this uh, officiality, if that's such a word, um, I think it's unlikely that this hand stamp was brought into use before Hong Kong had been ceded in perpetuity, or so they thought, by the Treaty of Nanking in 29th of August, 1842. So I think that roughly that this is associated with this event. Now, 
the London newspapers of 21st of January, and I've, I've put an extract from one of them in the top right, noted that uh, this handstone was on mail arriving uh, in the Overland Mail of the 1st of December, 1842. Um, this mail had latest Hong Kong dates up to 13th of October, and the previous latest dates were up to 24th of September. So these letters were probably handled at Hong Kong between 25th of September and 13th of October, 1842. But based on the evidence of uh, existing covers, which we'll have a look at in a minute, the first Royal Arms covers actually arrived in England on 22nd of November, 1842, as part of the mail that was dispatched from Bombay on the Zenobia on the 16th of October. And these letters would have been dispatched from Hong Kong by the Sisostris on the steamer Sisostris on the 10th of September, 1842. The Sesostris brought the news of peace and signing of the treaty at uh, Nanking from the Yangtze River to Hong Kong. They arrived at Hong Kong on the 9th of September, but there was clearly an anticipation of this outcome, even though there was no uh, real uh, official information coming from that uh, theater for a period before 9th of September. And Johnston may well have relied on this to arrange for the local production of the Royal Arms Handstone and order its introduction at the post office in place of the uh, Web Type 3 Handstone upon or immediately I would think upon arrival of the Sisotris. So that went around about the 9th of September. So jumping again, some of the early Royal Arms covers with recorded date, please be careful of recorded dates, as mentioned already, um, because the 20th of June was not the earliest uh, handled at uh, the Hong Kong Post Office. In fact, there was a rather amazingly delayed uh, item, as we can see, that ended up arriving in January 1843, having been written in June 1842. Actually, when I was uh, researching all this stuff, it was quite amazing how many times the postal arrangements were in almost chaos. There were mails coming to Macau and Hong Kong, which ended up in uh, North China and came back from there. They arrived by naval ship and they were not offloaded. Uh, at Macau or Hong Kong. Um, there are numerous examples. The, the, the Sisotras went to Bombay, but there was another steamer went to Calcutta with the mails, and they completely messed that up. There were Singapore mails that arrived in Hong Kong. Uh, it was quite, honestly, it was a bit of a Bit of a lottery. Anyway, these are only nine of the 88 that we've got recorded. And so we'll have a look at a few of these, and in particular, number three and number four. So here I've got to say thank you to uh, my old friend Sam for this one. So this, this 
this cover is very, very interesting for me. Oh, and, and, and it doesn't have any date on it. It didn't have any contents, uh, but it was annotated Overland Mail by a Bombay. And it has the on that India oval to show that it went by Overland Mail and it was rated three and sixpence. So it went by Marseille, three quarter ounce letter rate. And it has uh, an arrival stamp of 24th of November, 1842, Gosport. Gosport is a small town close to the Royal Navy port of Portsmouth. Plymouth, excuse me, sorry, I'm starting to fade. And from there, it was delivered to Mrs. Bowden at the Unique Lodge. Uh, that was Mrs. Elizabeth. Bowden, and she was the mother of the sender, who was William Bowden, and he was a volunteer first class on the HMS Cornwallis. A volunteer first class was like uh, an apprentice officer in the Royal Navy, who, uh, after promotion to midshipman, um, taking his examinations could be promoted to lieutenant. Uh, this man, William Bowden, the sender, uh, was born in 1826. His mother was Elizabeth, and his father was also, also William, many Williams in those days. Uh, and he was a purser in the Royal Navy. And when I Check the 1841 census. Uh, Elizabeth uh, was uh, registered as resident at the unique lodge, Alverstoke. Alverstoke is very close to Gosport uh, with her daughter. And so, what do we know? Then William, the sender, would have been 16 years old when he sent this letter to his mother from HMS Cornwallis. On the reverse of this uh, cover are some Chinese characters, which are quite, on the face of it, quite mystifying. <laughs> but after some very, clever research by Sam uh, with his uh, philatelic buddies in the PRC. Um, it was established that these are delivery instructions associated with local letter courier companies. Two of them are mentioned. And there's a date there uh, which if we use the Gregorian uh, calendar as 25th of July, 1842. Some of this is, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, uh, some of these, these characters are particular to the Suchow uh, area of China, uh, which is uh, in uh, Qingqiang, and uh, Nanking. So this cover originated uh, from the naval force at the Yangtze River. And on the 26th of July, which is the day after, was written, HMS Cornwallis was situated off Qingqiangfu. Later, uh, Qingqiang. And the map, well, the sketch that I've shown here, I think you can see Qing, Qing Fu on the right hand side, uh, almost opposite the entrance to the Grand Canal. 
So it was the fortress at the end of the Grand Canal and controlled it. And then Nanjing is over to the left. And just above Nanjing, you can see the word Cornwallis because that's where it was stationed uh, when the Treaty of Nanjing was signed on the 29th of August, 1842. And this, this cover would have been handled by the Hong Kong Post Office and forwarded to England, as I've shown here. It would have gone by the steamer Sisostris to Bombay, left on the 10th of September, and then by the overland mail Zenobia and Admiralty packets through the Mediterranean, and arrived in London on 22nd of November by train from Marseille, and then was forwarded to the addressee's local post, post office in the postal town of Gosport, where it was stamped on 24th of November. Just for fun, here is a painting of Cornwallis in the attack on Qin Qian Fu. One on the left, she is the one on the left. Now, William Bowden was mentioned in dispatches actually, for his role in the assault on the west gate of Chinchen Fu and the attack of Tartar troops in that city. The Tartar troops were the uh, elite troops of the emperor. And they, they were the ones who uh, put up most resistance to these British people. And he was also in the assault force at Chapu, which is at the mouth of the Yangtze River. And that was in mid-May, 1842. So by coincidence and perhaps luck, there is another uh, Royal Arms cover uh, once part of John Sussex collection. And this arrived at the addressee's local post office uh, at Wakefield, Yorkshire, on the same day, 24th of November, 1842. And this originated from William, the other one, Armitage, who was a mate on HMS Dido and was sent to. Mrs. Armitage. Uh, William was the son of Sir George Armitage. And a mate is akin to a midship. So again, he was waiting for a promotion to lieutenant. Uh, he would have been a teenager. This cover also handled at the Hong Kong Post Office and um, went by same routing as the Bowden cover. And on the 26th of July, the date that it was annotated as being written, HMS Dido was near Qingqiang Fu, but separated from HMS Cornwallis and blockading the entrance to the Grand Canal. So uh, the Sisotris, along with the steamer Tenasseru, left Nanking on the 31st of August, 1842. Uh, Sisostris arrived on the 9th of September at Hong Kong, and Tenasseru, which stopped briefly at Amoy, and would have picked up mail there, uh, arrived the day after. Sisotris took uh, the mail to Bombay, including mail to the overland route, including the two that we just saw. Uh, no, sorry, um, inc not including the, those two, sorry. And the Tenasserim uh, took mail for Calcutta, Singapore. So the Bowden cover was clearly a part of the first mail from China arriving in England with Royal Arms handstand. And it 
may well have been a first day cover. But who knows? We also know of another cover which came from Name King from a Lieutenant Kirby, um, 22nd of August 42. But this one went via Falmouth. Uh, doesn't have a Royal Arms marking, but it would have uh, been on the Sisostris. And there's also an Edwards cover dated uh, 20th of August, which arrived at Western Supermare on the 7th of December without Royal Arms markings again. So this suggests that the two covers that do have the Royal Arms markings uh, were at the Hong Kong post office earlier than the arrival of Sisotris on the 9th of September, while the Lieutenant Kirby and Edwards covers came from the north on board that uh, ship, a steamer, and the mail bags were not unloaded at Hong Kong. More difficult is how did these two Royal Arm covers get to Hong Kong since it was well reported that there was no news from the north, from the Yangtze, uh, for some time prior to arrival of the Sisotris. Letters have been received from Chu San headquarter, headquarters, but these had also said that they hadn't heard anything very much from the Yangtze. But putting one and one together and perhaps getting two or three, then uh, from the delivery instructions in Chinese on the reverse of the Bowden cover, it seems likely that these two covers were sent by Chinese letter courier service from Nanking or Tinkiang Fu uh, to Chusan or Hong Kong, and were eventually handed in at the Hong Kong post office for inclusion in the mail bag for dispatch in connection with the next overland mail via Bombay. It is known that local couriers were used to send letters, at least official ones, from the naval force on the Yangtze River. That was the only way they had of communicating because no shipping uh, went downstream for quite a while. The two covers must have arrived at the Hong Kong post office after the dispatch of various sailing vessels which connected with the December overland mail. These included the Anonyma and various uh, shipping, all of which would have carried mail because no one knew that the Sisostris was coming down. And these sailing ships cleared Chinese waters between 28th of August and 6th of September, 1842. So it seems that these Royal Arm covers, two, two of them, must have arrived immediately before the Sisostris arrived on the 9th and they were hand stamped and loaded on the steamer, uh, which overtook the sailing vessels and connected with the departure of the Zenobia on the 16th of October, of, of October excuse me. At uh, that time of year, uh, sailing ships found it really difficult heading from Hong Kong down through Singapore, uh, even though the Anonyma, for example, was a quick, Clipper. But uh, I've checked, um, it took 33 days for the Anonymous to get to Singapore, which was 11 days after the Sisostris arrived there. And the Jamsetji Jiboy um, took even longer. Sorry, let me just explain. Uh, the, the direction of monsoon winds 
completely changed um, the sailing times for for sail sail ships. Um, at least twenty days difference if you were going with the wind or against the wind. Um, for example, Anonima in November, by its next trip, um, did Hong Kong to Singapore in five days, whereas it took 33 uh, in this particular case. So there was quite a big difference. And steamer at that time of year was the way to go. Then we, we know from covers eight and nine, I'm not going back, I don't want to get a bit out here, uh, that there was a dispatch also uh, after the departure that connected with the November overland mail. And these went by the steam frigate Auckland. And the Auckland was sent direct to Suez. It carried Major Malcolm and the signed treaty. So it was supposed to get to England and Queen Victoria ASAP. Um, but it did bunker. I, it it uh, took coal um, at Singapore and at Gaul, Ceylon. And letters for Bombay for the overland route were offloaded at Gaul and then forwarded by Bombay, from Bombay on the 1st of November by the Atalanta. And this cover is an example with the Royal Arms that followed that route. It's from uh, Russell and Company. The overland mails that arrived in London um, included letters that were sent by sailing ships, letters sent by the Auckland and offloaded at Gaul, and also included ones that stayed on the Auckland and were offloaded at Suez, and similarly for the Falmouth letters. Here's one that went, stayed on the Auckland. How do we know that? It has no India oval marking. And we know that it, it's a rival and so on and so on. So this one stayed on board. It's annotated in the bottom left, paid one rupee, which was a bit of a waste of time because that was unnecessary. But the senders, Turner and Company, at that time, they didn't, didn't know what it was going to end up on, which ship. And um, payment of the Indian postage was becoming uh, an issue. And it was quite complicated. And people were quite confused about what to do. In fact, letters are known to have been sent with a one rupee coin stuck to the outside of the cover. It's, it was a bit of a shambles. So there we are. And my final, uh, you can just carry on <laughs> with all this, all this stuff. <laughs> um, finally, um, I would like to say thank you to Andrew, Sam, Neil, G Neil Granger, because quite a few of the illustrations were from his very nice uh, auction earlier in the year. Feldman, Christie's, InterAsia, Jumble, uh, Public Record Office in Kew, and Wikipedia for some of the nice sort of looking things. Um, much appreciation. Andrew, Sam, and Chris Norton as well, please.
uh, for their kind help. And it would be wrong if I did not take this opportunity to highlight significant and influential work of Mr. Lee Scamp, mm -hmm. the yeah. doyen of early postal history. He showed us how to properly research, record, and share matters of importance. Uh, he, he's my guide on these uh, matters. Thank you to him. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just for the sake of completeness, there's uh, a sort of a bridged version of the references. I think most people know these anyway. Thank you. A round of applause for the speaker, please. It is a most wonderful presentation. We haven't heard for many, 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 many years. Uh, you know, the depth of research, the time Richard must have spent on the digging everything up and checking all the newspapers must be just daunting. It's a daunting task, basically. So I really enjoyed it very much and I'll probably go back again tomorrow and, and then go through the whole thing again. So uh, before we leave, uh, uh, have you have everybody got any questions to, to ask Richard? Okay, maybe maybe I'll ask uh, 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 a silly question. <laughs> uh, where do you get all the um, uh, the the Indian the, the ships uh, uh, the, the EIC from India? The information. Hmm? The information. Oh, oh. right. Uh, Lee Scamp did uh, some work on that. Yeah. In his in his uh, book, what the, the, what's it called? Itineraries. He oh, did the, a book the, with the, the itineraries, right? Yeah. But that yeah. doesn't that doesn't have it all, and there's one or two uh, slight uh, inaccuracies in it. Yeah. Uh, but basically, I got it from uh, London newspapers. Uh huh. A cube. They used. They had everything. They, they had everything. So you need to go to queue. No, you can you can you can see quite a lot online. Oh really? Okay, okay, that's good. You have to Very you have to pay good. a little bit. But... <laughs> <laughs> and, and also and also, I mean, I for this exercise, I did I have some uh, Hong Kong, Canton Register, Canton Press here, Friends of China. Yeah. But I couldn't really get out to do that. And I also relied to quite a big extent on uh, Singapore, Singapore uh, mails, uh, oh. newspapers, sorry. Straight, yeah, straight times, straight time, yeah. Uh, yeah, Singapore Free Press, Yeah, I think. Usual Andrew, sort. The, the, uh, the EIC itineraries from in India are in this publication by, um, by Hammond Giles. Oh, right, 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 yeah. That yeah. one you might, you might have seen. And, and the Canton Press and Canton Register are, actually there's an online archive for that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can send the link if you guys want it. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's great. Please, please, because I couldn't, I couldn't find that. And I, I did it when I was in Hong Kong, I did it so in the Hong Kong U, but, here they only have it uh, at the Q and the British Library. My wife doesn't allow me to go there at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's the um, is the Jardine Archive uh, accessible to the public? Not sure, but sure, yeah, could could be interesting. Uh, Richard, have you have access to this bulletin? I don't know if you see it upside down or no, 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 I don't, no, I haven't. No, that is uh, the Magales, which uh, did the study on uh, all the Macao markings. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, uh, it, yeah. Ha it has been translated in English. Yeah, um, I don't think yeah, I've done have, that. You, have you seen it? 
I've seen it, but I don't have it. Okay. I think. Well, anyway, it, 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 uh, it can be found. I, I don't know where, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I have yeah. it. It's, uh... Yeah, yeah, thank you. I don't think it will add much to your presentation, which is very comprehensive, but it's a, it's a nice reference document. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, by, by the way, um, regarding the, 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 um, the 1842 uh, Hong Kong Post Office uh, uh, cover from the, um, from the missionary letter, uh, 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 Philippe actually helped to translate the content. Oh, yeah, he did. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, Philippe. Thank you. I've added a, I've added a little bit though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are Mr. welcome. Mr. Jose, Mr. Jose, <laughs> is the, the main man. Yeah. Very, diff very difficult to read. I mean, or, you know, even even for a Frenchman, because some of the, the script is is uh, yeah. is impossible. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, I yeah. Actually, uh, the, the other question actually, is actually um, yeah. that we actually uh, Richard and I actually discussed privately. Is regarding the, the material uh, used uh, to uh, to make the hand stamp. Uh, uh, particularly, I'm talking about the uh, the Hong Kong Post Office uh, 1841 hand stamp. I mean, which would be the 41 and 42 would be exactly the same, but what with the, with the one gouged out. So um, I just wonder what kind of material that would be, would it? Because uh, you know, it was it 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 it, it, it could be. Uh, what, what do you think? I mean, is it is it made of some kind of uh, sort of metal or brass or or maybe something? Well, so certainly not rubber or wood. I mean, it looks like uh, it's like a, like a soft material. Would be well, one thing I could think of is ivory. They could carve it out. Um... Yep, quite possibly, I think. Any idea, Andrew? I don't own one, so I can't put it <laughs> under magnification. So I thought you got the original hand stamp. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, but you could order online in Beijing, right? All right. For 38 yeah. bucks or something. <laughs> you could have one made. Oh, really? One day yeah. delivery. You in could May. have a 1843 if you want. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. How's the ed how's the edges on sorry Andrew how's the edges on the on the strike? Well you own one so no is it very sharp? What you mean the 42? Yeah the 42. No, is it very piece. sharp? I the piece yeah. that uh that piece, yeah. yeah is it very sharp? No, it's not it's not it's not sharp at all. It's not sharp at all. I mean it just looks like something very soft. So it that doesn't look it doesn't look metallic. So that's why I wonder whether it could be made of ivory, which is which is very easy to carve. And then certainly when I actually went into the Hong Kong Museum of History, actually I saw one of the uh, uh, forwarding agent uh, uh, hand stamp. It was actually carved out of uh, ivory. It was displayed there. Well, I, I, I have uh, also seen another one uh, in Macau Museum before. Uh, I think it is a postal museum before. Uh, it is also made of that materials. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's possible because, uh, uh, you know, ivory uh, had been around for a long, long time. So, uh, and it's very easy to carve it. But but the other one, the, the, uh, the, the oval royal arms, I think that would be made of brass or something like that, metal. It's yeah. very... Look, looks very, 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 the design is very complicated. And, and um, but on the other hand, actually, if you look at all the later uh, 43 to 44 covers, and a lot of them actually deteriorated into a smudge. And if you look at the 44, 1844, it's all like a, like a, just a, you know, you can't see, can, you can't see any details at all. Whereas the, um, the 42 and 43 are quite crisp. You can see all the beautiful details of the unicorn and the lion. So I just I just beginning to wonder whether that's made of maybe made of a softer material. Yeah. Anyhow, so uh, it's, in, it's really it's inconclusive until we actually see an example, not necessary from Hong Kong, maybe from other British colonies, 
uh, maybe there, there's something in the in, in the, the, the British Museum. Or so you, you could have this. I'm I'm pretty sure that you could have this, a similar similar device from a different uh, British colony that, that survived. And that that would actually confirm what kind of material is made of. Andrew, yeah. I think it's a combination of both the material and the ink used. Uh -huh. I mean, I to I used to do the ink. That was my thing. Oh, so right. whatever yeah, solvent in there could, uh, you know, we we see the 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 so-called you know 1897 dollar chops and they rotted instantly with that with the yeah. ink usages. So that's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, acidic, a uh, lot of acid in the in the in the pigment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Thanks, Richard. Now I could tell people I might have a first day cover, right? <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, 18, 1842 first day cover. <laughs> According to Richard, the very famous Richard Whittington. And I have it on recording. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Thank maybe, you. Maybe. 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 Yeah. Maybe. 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 <laughs> Uh, Richard has, uh, by the way, Richard has kindly written an article uh, about this. Uh, I think it, it, it basically it's it's like a like a pacey of the of the of the talk tonight in the um, in the in the uh, uh, the forthcoming uh, Hong Kong Philatelic Society journal. Um, I think uh, well, it's it's I don't know how many pages, maybe 15, 20 pages he has written, but. Um, I think that his talk tonight, I mean, it is 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 just just extraordinary, really. And um, and really, Richard, you should you 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 should try uh, uh, writing um, uh, uh, a book or something <laughs> on the subject. I mean, it would be a, I'm sure it would be a bestseller <laughs> among the <laughs> historian, like, and even a historian. You know, you you go and you go and tell the Hong Kong Post that they actually own something which, which is a huge treasure. I mean, you know, they they won't just say, oh, you know, you know we we bought it, you know, about twenty five years ago without knowing what it is, and uh, they even got the got the name, even got the address, you know, the the recipient the name wrong, I mean, you know, in, in the description, you know. Correct. Anyway, okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we will we'll close the presentation um, you know, by, by thanking uh, Richard again. And we hope to see uh, maybe Richard can think of another subject uh, which could give uh, another solo presentation, which is, which is actually most entertaining. And, and it, it is just extraordinary and we learn a lot. I'm sure all of you would have agreed. Um, well, on that note, um, I'll say, uh, you know, have a, have a nice morning, afternoon and evening to all of you. And uh, we look forward to some volunteer uh, who would uh, actually give another talk next month. And um, well, see you then. Okay. Good night. Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yeah.